My, uh, my sermon is entitled, Though Your Sins Be As Scarlet. And I, I got that uh, actually from Isaiah 118. And I would like to read that, or have you read it with me, uh, Isaiah 118. What it says there is, Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like crimson, they shall be as wool. This is one of the greatest texts in the Bible. When I read this, and I saw in there in the first part of it where it says, you know, he wants to reason with us, it, it just hit home. You know, we have a wonderful, loving Father, and he does want to reason with us. And I'm glad that this text is there. Now we know that any man, even though he has gone far away from God and deep down into sin, can have all of these sins taken away. The scarlet can be as snow, and, and we've seen plenty of snow. The crimson can be as wool. We see in this text that God is a very reasonable God. He's a gentleman. He never forces anything down our throats. He talks to us. He reasons with us. He counsels us, but he leaves it up to us as to whether we will follow him or not. He is simply saying in this text, I want to sit down with you. I want to talk things over with you. Let's reason this thing out. And I promise you that if you will put your trust in me, I'll wash your sins away. Now, God knows this. If you are reasonable and sensible, you will listen to him and use your intellect, and you will do the right thing to be saved. Now, I want, to, want you to picture something in your mind this morning, so I'm going, to, I'm going to take just a moment away, and I'm going to turn my back on you here because I've got to set up a couple props here. So don't, don't give up on me. I'm not leaving this. I'm not leaving. I'm just going back here to get a couple chairs. Now, I want you to draw this picture in your mind. God sits in one chair, and a lost sinner sits in another, and filled with compassion and love. What will God say to the sinner? Well, the first thing that God will say is that you must realize that you are a sinner. And now, Today, we don't hear God's voice, but we can hear God's voice. We can read it in the Bible. It's there. His words are there. We can read them. We can know what he would say. And we need to look into Romans 3, 23, to see what God is going to say to this sinner. In Romans 3, 23, and it says there, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, you notice the word all. He doesn't say that some have sinned, or a few, or even many. But all have sinned and fell short of the glory of God. And now, I'll have you turn with me to Isaiah. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, verse 6. That's Isaiah 53, verse 6. And it says there, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And once again, you see that he uses the word all. Each of us. Every one of us. And then we can also look in the book of Romans, back to Romans again, in uh, Romans 3, verse 10. Romans 3, verse 10, and it says there, As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. And then finally, we turn with me to Jer Jeremiah, 17th chapter in the ninth verse. And it says there, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? Now, God is not merely saying here that we have done some sinful things. He is also saying that we have a sinful nature. 
Some people may say, I'll cut off this sin or I'll give up this uh, bad habit maybe that I have. And you can do that, but you'd still be a sinner. God is not so much concerned with the fact that you have sinned, but that you are a sinner. An apple tree is not an apple tree because it bears apples. It bears apples because it's an apple tree. And you, us, we, are not a sinner because you sin. You sin because you are a sinner. You have a sinful nature. Now the good angels, they don't, they, don't, they don't sin because they are angels. But you do sin because you are a sinner. Now, you can get rid of some sins, or maybe even many sins, and still be a sinner. There was a pastor who was preaching a revival in a little country church out in the community, and, and on, on the very first day of the meeting, a good woman said to the pastor, Some of the young men in the community are playing cards, and they're gambling. I want you to preach a sermon against gambling. Now, he thought about that for a little bit, and he knew that if he succeeded in getting his men to give up their gambling, that would not have solved the problem. So he didn't preach about gambling. He preached Christ, who could save from all sin. And when these young men came and heard the message, they were converted, gave up their gambling. Men are not changed by giving up just a few sins. They are changed by conversion, by conversion to Christ. Then they have a power to overcome their sins. There was a young man that he attended church almost every Sunday, but he had a drinking problem. After he'd been on a drunken spree for about three days, <laughs> uh, he was at home sick in bed. And you might know, the pastor happened by to visit with him. And when he seen the preacher coming in, he, he, he was, says, oh my, he said, preacher, he said, you don't have to worry, I, I'm going to quit drinking. The doctor told me that if I continue to drink, I might go out like a light one these days. Now, his resolution was good. And it was good that he wanted to quit drinking. But you see, the resolution didn't last long because it was born out of fear, not out of a new birth. What he needed to do was merely to give up something. He didn't need to just give up his drinking. He needed a new life. He needed to be born again. Now, we notice that God says that we have gone astray like sheep, not like dogs or horses or or cows, they can never find their way home. Or they can find their way home. But the sheep, they have a problem. It seems like when sheep get out there, they just get into their own little world and, and they forget what way it is to get home. So Jesus, the great shepherd, came down to earth. He came looking for his lost sheep that he might save them and bring them home. God also says... We have turned to our own ways. <laughs> now, there are just two ways to turn. We can turn to our way, or we can turn to God's way. And if you have not turned to God's way, you are going down the wrong way. And that's the way of sin. And that way leads to hell. So God says you must realize. He, he, he's pleading with a, with a sinner back there. He's trying to explain to him. You must realize that you are a sinner. And the sinners are lost. Why does God want you to feel that way? Because if you see yourself as a sinner, you'll feel the need for a Savior. It's when a man knows he is drowning that he feels the need for a rescuer. It's when a man knows he's sick that he feels the need for a doctor. It's when a man knows he is a sinner that he feels the need for a Savior. So why don't you just say to God, who reasons with you, Yes, Lord, I know I am a sinner. Now, the second thing that God says back here to this man, this sinner, he says, I love you in spite of your sin. And he says that with all of his heart. I love you in spite of your sin. But you say, how can can that be possible? 
If I'm a sinner, how can a holy and righteous God love me? I don't love the unlovely. I don't love those who oppose me. How can God love me when I have sinned so grievously against him? Well, that's why he is God. He can do what you can't do. He hates your sin. But believe me, he loves you. How do we know that God loves a sinner? Well, we can go to Calvary and see God's son dying on the cross with blood oozing out of his body and running down the cross. And we cry out, why does God allow this? And one answer comes back from the skies and we hear it. And that answer comes back. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. A father loves a prodigal son. A mother loves a wondering child. A wife can even love an unfaithful husband. And a patriot can love his country. But all of this is nothing. Nothing. To compare to God's love for sinners. How wide and deep is God's love? Well, think of such men as Hitler and Mussolini back during World War II, and and all the evil that come out of their lives and their plans. Of course, God did not approve of what they did. But if these men had come to him in, in repentance, true repentance, he would have forgiven them. He loved them, but not their deeds. Maybe you were saying, I have stooped pretty low. I've done things I don't want anybody else to even know about. And I'm sure all of us have done some things in our lives that we would like to be able to go back and say, I wish I'd never said that. I, out of anger, I said things that I shouldn't have said. Or, or maybe there's other things even more serious than that in your life that you wouldn't want anybody to know about. But you see, that doesn't matter. And the things that does matter is that God loves you and every other sinner on earth. Now, I'd like to go back and read a little more scripture. If you look with me in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 8, we'll see this. In Romans 5, 8, it says, But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, this verse doesn't say (laughs) that he extended his love and gave his son for perfect people, but for sinners. Now, God's love calls for a response. With this great love that God has for us, there should be a response. What are you going to do about his love? Are you going to turn your back on it? Are you simply going to ignore it? Oh, don't do that, my friend. Let the great love, let that great powerful love that God has for us break your heart and bring you to him. The third thing that God says is, I don't want you to perish. Look with me again at the Bible. In the Bible to 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord Lord is... The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And then we can go back to the Old Testament and read Ezekiel. Ezekiel 33, 11. And here God is talking to the Israelites, but he could just as well be talking to us right here in America today. He says to them, say to them, As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, O house of America? Here it says, O house of Israel in the Bible. But it could be America. It could be the United States. Look at what we've done. Look at what this world is coming to. 
We are told that Eichmann and the Nazi butchers killed six million Jews. They seem to derive pleasure from thrusting these people into these gas chambers and watching them die. They were men. Oh, they were men. They were evil men. God is not like that. He gets no pleasure from seeing one's, anyone suffer. So all the way through the Bible, he is pleading and begging with men and women to turn away from their sin and live. And we look back in Noah's time, the world was filled with some of the rankest sinners. God did not want to see them die, so he sent Noah to preach repentance and salvation to them. And for a hundred years, he worked on that ark and got it built. In the meantime, he was going around and talking to people and trying to convince them that they needed to turn from their wicked ways. He didn't want people to die. He didn't want people in Nineveh to die, so he sent Jonah to preach to them. And let me tell you, he doesn't want to see you die. So he sent his son to die for you and provide a way of escape for you. My first wife, Joyce, her father was a, a railroader, and he got to run those engines and stuff down the railroad tracks, and I always found that interesting when he'd come home, and I'd talk to him, and I always wondered, you know, at night, you can't see very far. They have a light out there in front of it, but you don't know what's laying up ahead, and you're traveling down those rails maybe 70 mile an hour. Now, he tells me that the railroads have their efficient red light warning systems, and when the engineer peers into the night and sees the red light shining, he knows there is danger ahead and brings his engine to a stop. To go through the red light means that it could bring him death or even death to his passengers. And in like manner, God has set up his red lights along life's pathway to save men from hell. What are some of them? Well, there's the Bible. We have the Bible we could turn to. We should take that Bible down off the shelf and dust it off and actually get in there and read it and study it. And then there's the gospel sermons that we hear here from Mark and, and, and other preachers here in the church on Sundays. There is the witness of a good friend. And then there are sorrows of life. And finally, there's the Holy Spirit. Now, if you crash through all of these warning signals, you're going to go down to hell. Yet, all the while, God is saying, I don't want this to happen to you. I've done everything necessary to save you. Now, back here, God is trying to reason with a sinner. He's trying to get through to him. And the fourth thing that God says is, I offer you salvation through my son. You see, the sinner deserves to die. But God loves the sinner so much that in spite of the sin, that he sent his son to die in the sinner's place. Now, do you remember Barabbas? He was in prison the day that Christ was to be crucified, but Pilate, the governor, had a custom of releasing a prisoner on a certain holiday. He gave the people the privilege of choosing the one to be released, so he brought both Jesus and Barabbas out and placed one on his right side and one on his left. Then he asked the mob, which one shall I release to you? Think of the choice that they had to make. One side stood the sinless Son of God who had gone about doing good, had never done anything wrong. And on the other side was Barabbas, and everybody in the community knew the evil deeds that he had done. And what choice did the people make? They cried out, Release unto us Barabbas and crucify Jesus. Crucify him! Crucify him! So Barabbas went free, and Jesus died. As he hung on the cross, I can only imagine that Barabbas crept up close to that cross and said, there's where I should have died today. But thank God that wonderful man died in my place. Listen, I'm going to tell you, that should be the cry of every man and every woman. As you think of your sin, as you know you deserve death, as you see Jesus dying on the cross in your place, you ought to cry out, I belong there, I sinned. I deserve death. But he died there for me. So I'll take him as my Savior, and I'll love him, and I'll serve him all of my life. Some years ago, 
a man was gloriously saved, and someone asked him how it had happened. Well, he thought about it for a little while, and then he, he answered. He said, you know, he said, I swapped with Jesus. I swapped my sin for his salvation. I gave him my sin, and he gave me everlasting life. You see, that's what happens in salvation. And it's the most wonderful bargain a man can ever make. Salvation is a simple matter. But men, we, we, we try to make it difficult. Now, there was a certain lawyer, and you know lawyers, they, they, look, they want every T crossed and every I dotted. And he said, before I was saved, I used to think that if I ever became a Christian, it would have to be in some great center of learning where all of my questions could be answered. But instead, I was saved in a risk rescue mission as I knelt in front with human derelicts all around me. When I knelt, I had all of my questions. When I arose, they were gone. God didn't answer them. He removed them. Oh, stolen sin. Don't go around looking for arguments and answers. Just come to Jesus. He is the answer. Christ is your only hope. He saves you when you come to him in simple faith. All your good works, all of your gifts, all of your kindness to others, all of your form and ritualism can never save you. Only Jesus can do that. I was reading about a missionary who was in Lima, Peru on Corpus Christi Day. All the stores closed their doors. Thousands of people gathered in the square in front of the cathedral while other thousands stood and sat inside. Soon the altar boys, well, they come out, followed by the bishop, seated on his throne. Several priests carried the throne, and several others carried a canopy over top of the, the bishop's head. They walked around several blocks in the downtown area. They stopped at some type of shrine at every corner and celebrated mass. Hundreds of solemn-faced people followed the procession through the town. But the missionary said that there was no peace. There was no happiness in their faces. You see, men do not find peace and salvation in religious ceremonies. The Bible says that they must come to the Lord with a broken and open heart. Then, and only then, can they find the peace that passes all understanding. When a man says, my heart is burdened with my sin, but I now humbly repent of it all and simply trust, trust Jesus for my salvation. In that minute, he is saved, and all the bells of heaven ring out for joy. Here is a man, and I can relate to this. <laughs> I don't come home from work anymore because I'm retired, but here's a man who comes home at night, all tired out, and he says to his wife, what must I do? I'm so tired. I need rest. And she replies, well, I'll tell you what, you can believe on that chair back there, <laughs> that recliner that you always sit in. You'll find rest there. He says, I do believe. I have always believed in that chair, but I'm still weary. And what else must I do? Then she says, trust the chair. Commit yourself to it. Give yourself up to it. Lean on it with all of your might. <laughs> Then he goes and sits down in the chair, and it feels so good, and he says, I think I'm resting now. Why didn't you tell me to trust the chair and commit myself to it? The moment I sat down, I began to rest. Now, I say, when you say to me that you want to be saved, I say to you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. When you say, do you mean that I am to believe in him in my mind? I've always done that. I believe he was the son of God and that he died on the cross. But I say to you, faith means much more than that. Trust your all to him, all the past, your present and the future. Commit everything to him. Lean entirely on him and commit everything to him. Lean on him. And the minute you do, 
you will find rest and peace and eternal life. And you will be able to say, all is mine because I trusted him. Now I tell you, there are many out there who are living in sin. Some have never heard the gospel preached. Some may not have ever even been inside of a church building. And I'm sure there are some that go to church almost every Sunday, but they've never accepted Christ as their Savior. They know about Jesus, but they have never turned their lives over him completely. God loves the sinner. He's been sitting back here with this other man back here trying to convince him of that. But they have never turned their lives over completely to him. And God loves them, and we should too. It's our job to reach out to the lost. Now, I'm not a preacher. I don't feel that preaching is probably my calling. But the Holy Spirit, when I started to know that I was going to preach this, the Holy Spirit put it onto my heart that there may be somebody out there that needs to be saved that might be able to hear these words. Maybe they can be convinced of the love that God has for them, how Jesus wants them to come. He directed me to Isaiah when I read that with a God reasons with us. The reason I put the chairs back here so that you could see in your mind God pleading with his people. I don't want anyone to be lost. You know, we have, we have hear people say, I know I'm a sinner, and I know, and I really would like to come to Christ and accept him as my Savior, but there's just so many things going on right now in my life, I don't see how I'm going to have time. Maybe later on, maybe, maybe this summer, maybe next year, I can do that, and I can really commit myself to him. But brother and sister, let me tell you, we don't know what tomorrow will bring. We don't even know what the next day may bring. I can give you an example. My wife, Darlene, was out for the day shopping. <laughs> Women like to shop. And she was out there with two girlfriends shopping. And She'd come home, and she'd had a good time. She'd even stopped and had dinner. And she had made the comment to the girls that we should do this every month. We should take, and because she said, I really enjoyed this. We had a good time. She came in the house carrying her packages, and she said, you know, I'm going to have to lay down because my back's hurting me really bad. I don't know what's wrong. And I said, sweetheart, I said, I'm going to take you to the emergency room because I think we ought to check on it and make sure that everything's okay. So we did that. I, she talked her into it, and we got her up to the emergency room and took her in, and they checked her all out, and they said, well, and it's not her heart. Uh, and the, one of the nurses told me, well, it, you know, you get back pain sometimes from your gallbladder. And uh, so after they had her there an hour or two doing tests, they said, well, we want to keep her overnight just to check on her and make sure that she's going to be okay. And I said, okay. And they said, we're going to put her in room 405. I'll never forget that number. And they put her up in room 405. And I told her, I said, sweetheart, I said, I'm going to take my car and move it around to the front of the hospital, and I'll meet you up there in, in the room. And so I did that. And I got up to the hospital, and I got upstairs to room 405. And she looked comfortable. She was laying in her bed up there and had the pillows propped up behind her. And I went over to her, and she took my hand, and she said, sweetheart, she said, uh, I'm feeling better. She said, the pain seems to be gone now. And they're going to keep me overnight, but you can come up and get me tomorrow because I'll be coming home. And at that point, with her holding my hand, I looked away from her and talked to the nurse because he was trying to get blood out of the black back of her hand. She had her, her hand there in a fist, and he was trying to get her to open her hand. And I said, sweetheart, I said, open up your hand. And just before I had turned around and, and said this to her, I had asked her, I said, do you still have your gallbladder? 
because I don't know. I, we had only been married 13 years, and I didn't know whether she still had her gallbladder or not. And I asked her, I said, that could cause the pain in your back. And she said, yes. She said, I do have my gallbladder. I never let them take that from me. And she laughed about it. <laughs> I still got my gallbladder. And uh, when I looked over and seen him doing that, and I told her, I said, sweetheart, open up your hand. And I looked back to her because she didn't open up her hand, and I, I couldn't understand. And I, so I said, I repeated it. I said, sweetheart, open up your hand so he can get blood. And she didn't open up her hand. And I turned around and looked at her, and she was looking at me, and I said, sweetheart, are you all right? She didn't answer me. I said, sweetheart, can you hear me? She didn't answer me. I took my hand and waved it in front of her eyes. They didn't move. In that 15 seconds that I turned around and talked to that nurse, and I turned around, and 15 seconds before that, she had made a joke about having her gallbladder. That quickly, her spirit had left her body, and she'd gone to be with God and Jesus in heaven. I'll never forget that. She was planning on having these meetings every week or every month with her other girlfriends, and she was planning on me coming up and picking her up the next day, and that quick, all the plans were shot. She'd gone to be with her Lord. I just say that because if there's anyone out there that feels a tugging on their heart, that feels the Holy Spirit trying to convince them that now's the time, don't wait. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. So if there's anyone out there, out here, that needs to come and accept Christ as their Savior, you can do that as uh, the praise team comes and plays this last song. And if there's anyone out there watching on television or on their uh, phone, cell phone, I just tell you, don't wait. You can do it now. All you have to do is look up to God in heaven and say, I know that I'm a sinner. And I want to accept Christ as my Savior. And they look up in the, and you say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I accept him as my personal Savior. If you do that out there, in that moment, you will be saved. I don't know what churches you might go to out there. I have no idea. But if you do that, I, I plead with you. Go find yourself a good church one that preaches from the Word, one that preaches Christ and the Gospel, and your life will never be the same. Please come as the praise team plays the song.